When TSMC first opened its doors in February 1987, it leased a factory and staff from Taiwan's Industrial Technology Research Institute. The Taiwanese government had invested about $100 million at the start, but founder Dr. Morris Zhang said that the government never invested another dollar after that. TSMC also had a new unproven business model. At their founding, they were the only semiconductor company solely dedicated to manufacturing. There was no market for it. I'm excited about Dr. Zhang's upcoming autobiography. So in this brief video, we're going to look at TSMC's early years. Was it a win right off the bat? And what did they do that was so special? But first, let me talk about the Asianometry Patreon. Early access members get to see new videos and selected references for those videos first. Early access helps a lot and I appreciate every pledge. Thanks and on with the show. The idea of providing custom chips for customers who wanted them but can't afford the volume is not original. Fairchild Semiconductor, the big daddy of all semiconductor companies, had an interesting product in the 1960s called the Micro Mosaic. It was a logic chip with about 150 logic gates connected together with aluminum interconnects. By customizing those connects right at the end of the fabbing process, you can create a custom chip. Oh, by the way, Fairchild used a computer to determine how to place and route these interconnects. So along the way, they just casually invented electronic design automation. Fairchild eventually wound down the micro mosaic, but some of the team later founded LSI Logic, which made a business of providing these custom chips. Famously, Jensen Huang worked there before he founded NVIDIA. In March 1976, Morris Dang mentioned the idea to Texas Instruments Management in a strategic planning conference document. He proposed that TI aggregate outside customer demand in order to strengthen its own leading manufacturing capability. TI passed on the idea because, frankly, it made little sense to them that they should open up their fabs to their potential competitors. In fact, they went the opposite path. Three years after Morris Dong's memo, Texas Instruments started making consumer electronics products of their own, directly competing with its own customers. Some people have said that the T in TSMC could have stood for Texas. Makes for a great social media post, but a simplification. Morris himself said that the foundry concept could not have happened without the revolutionary work of Carver Mead and Lynn Conway. Without their ideas to use abstraction, hierarchies of systems and subsystems, as well as the use slash reuse of common blocks to wrestle the complexity of semiconductor design, Splitting chip design and manufacturing would have been impossible. Morris Dang will forever be known as TSMC's founder and longtime CEO. But at the start, Dang was only the company's chairman. For most Asian companies, including those in Taiwan, the chairman has a more active role in the company, serving as its representative in certain corporate affairs, but is not involved in everyday operations. So the company's first CEO was actually James E. Dykes, who joined in March 1987 from General Electric. Dykes had been the VP in charge of all of GE's semiconductor work, integrating RCA's factories after GE bought them in 1985. After two years of closing RCA's old factories, Dykes was tired of the job. They had basically put him out to pasture, allowing him to collect a paycheck while he looked for a real job. Times sure were different back then. The Taiwan government wanted Morris to find a foreign investor and a top-flight executive to run the TSMC startup. Morris wanted Dykes. Dykes first said no over the phone, but Dang flew over to North Carolina and walked him through the idea, and it convinced him. Dykes worked at TSMC for a few months, overseeing the construction of the company's first actual fab, now called Fab 2. After that was done, he completed his contract and returned to the United States. Dykes later passed away in Florida in 2013 at the age of 75. He was remembered for his kindness, compassion, and his love for hamburgers. Back then, there was no such thing as a fabless industry. Most people didn't care for this newfangled company out in backwards Taiwan. So from 1987 to 1991, TSMC survived by providing extra capacity in trailing edge products. One of these first customers, maybe their very first, was Intel. Morris Dang had known Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore for a long time. So in 1988, Andy Grove visited Taiwan to see TSMC's Fab 1 and its 3 micrometer node. Morris Dang recalls in a 2011 interview, 
I showed him we were getting good yields on 3 micron technology, which was two and a half generations behind Intel and Texas Instruments, but we were getting yields, and he was impressed. He said, maybe Intel can use you. The Taiwanese E-Tree Fabs had been getting yields superior to those found in the West ever since the RCA technology transfer days. So Grove went back to the United States and asked his engineers to try to make something work. During the accreditation phase, Intel found 200 issues. TSMC resolved them one by one and was thus certified to produce processors and Intel chipsets. Other American IDMs struck deals with TSMC as well, basically for anything that was popular at the time but they didn't have capacity for. For instance, TI and TSMC struck a 256K dynamic RAM production deal in 1988. At the time, the leading edge was 1 megabit. That fab which so impressed Andy Grove, Fab 1, could produce about 12,150 millimeter wafers a month. To make sure the line is always up and producing, the guys at Fab 1 put face stickers, emojis essentially, on the equipment. A smiling emoji sticker shows the machine is working fine, and is being actively used right at that moment. A sleeping emoji sticker means that the machine is working fine, but nobody is using it right now. A sleeping machine is not making money. A hurt face emoji shows that the machine is down right now for repair, and someone needs to be working on it. And finally, my favorite, a skeptical face emoji with one raised eyebrow means that the machine is not right, and that an engineer is or should be looking at it. We want all the machines on the line to be showing the happy sticker face. There is some psychological gaming going on there for everyone to jump on any sticker other than a smiley face. Soon after the company was founded, TSMC began working on their second FAB, FAB2, which was dedicated in 1990. FAB2 is a 500 nanometer node FAB capable of producing 30 to 40,150 millimeter wafers each month. TSMC closed down FAB1 in 2001. It remains the only factory TSMC has ever closed. They like to say that they have never closed down one of their FABs, and it is technically correct since they didn't build Fab 1. Why was the sticker system so important? How did TSMC get these impressive yields? Cycle time. Cycle time refers to how long it takes for a lot of wafers, typically 25 or more, to go through the entire wafer fabrication stage, all 600 to 1000 steps of them. In a 1989 interview, CEO Dykes laid out TSMC's plan for out-manufacturing the Japanese. We're going to have a very fast cycle time here. We're talking about 20 to 25 days from input to output. That's much faster than the Japanese. The area where the Japanese are worst is cycle time. If they tell you 40 days, they are running closer to 55. I think that's going to be one of our strong points. Peter Thiel wrote that every great business is built around a hidden secret. From the very beginning, TSMC's manufacturing secret is cycle time. I wish I can remember where I read this, but TSMC has long said that it focuses on cycle time as much as it focuses on yield. The shorter the cycle time, the faster they are running wafers through the system, and the faster they can run wafers through the system, the faster they can learn how to raise yields. In 1998, Morris Tang hand wrote TSMC's top priorities. Short cycle time from wafer start to finish wafer is number four. And it is when compared with the Japanese that the power of TSMC's curious business model becomes most apparent. In the early 1990s, if you wanted a silicon foundry, you went to the Japanese. The big Japanese semiconductor manufacturers had the capacity and some technology. For instance, FPGA maker Xilinx fabbed their first products at Seiko Corporation. But the Japanese companies wanted something in return. Seiko wanted and got exclusivity in the Japan market for Xilinx products. The Japanese also wanted product information about the chip you were fabbing. Maybe because they wanted to know how to help you make it better, or maybe because they were feeding that info back to their own designers. Dykes was very clear about TSMC's position on this. They don't compete with you, and they don't have any incentive to steal designs. Unlike with TI or the Japanese, TSMC enshrined this value right into the company charter. In 1991, Don Brooks joined TSMC as its third president. He replaced Klaus Wiemer, 
who went on to run Chartered Semiconductor in Singapore. Brooks had worked for 22 years at TI as an associate of Morris and really admired him, calling him one of the top semiconductor managers in the 70s and 80s. He also talked about the plethora of Asian talents. I have always been energized about Asia, the ability there to pull together a trained, loyal workforce, and the financial means for a venture. The environment there is so positive. In a later oral history, Brooks adds, Taiwan is homogenous. It's the U.S. a little bit of the 1950s, you know. It's a team effort. The pressures that go with that on a social level are just incredible. If one of the people doesn't pull their weight, it jeopardizes the bonuses and the profit sharing of the other people. This was a common theme about the Taiwanese workers. Wages and costs were, of course, a factor. Brooks explains that the lower base salaries meant that you can put two times more engineers to a task than you would be able to in the West. Note I said base salaries. Later on, engineers and workers enrolled in the TSMC profit sharing plan were earning TSMC stock worth hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. But low wages were far from why Taiwanese workers were so well suited for semiconductors. Otherwise, TSMC's China fabs would have had far superior economics to the Taiwan fabs, but they don't. Quality, retention, and education matters so much, too. Founding CEO Dykes observed that TSMC benefited from pulling from a very good talent pool. Two of Taiwan's top universities are nearby, and graduates there feed right into TSMC. And unlike with the Japanese, many Taiwanese had worked or studied in the United States. In 1987, over 32,000 of the 130,000 foreigners getting advanced degrees in the U.S. were from Taiwan. So Taiwanese were familiar with the West and can speak passable English. Things started to turn around in 1991 with the rise of the fabless industry. Semiconductor fabs were getting more expensive, and adding a new line might cost $200 million even back then. It not only squeezes the startups, but also the middle-class semiconductor makers. For those guys making between $100 million and $1 billion in revenues, adding a new line risks putting them into an overcapacity situation. But what if they were to always be able to tap capacity at a foundry that's interested in their success? News about TSMC winning business from prestigious customers like Intel and TI brought the Taiwanese design houses to their door. These design houses were small companies with little capital, but plenty of ideas for chips and everything from video games to computers. The emergence and growth of the fabless industry first in Taiwan and then in the U.S. fueled TSMC's growth far better than being a second source supplier from someone else. Interestingly enough, while Brooks and Dykes both recall being incredibly compelled by the foundry idea from the very beginning, Morris was the most negative on it, and he was the guy who recruited him there. Brooks remembers that when he joined in 1991, Morris told him with regards to the foundry business, in fact, he told me we are building Fab 2, but Don, I wouldn't anticipate there being a Fab 3. Don't get your hopes up. So when he speaks of being this visionary about this business, I don't think he had any idea what he was getting started. Remember that Don was still working on things at TSMC's founding Commercial Technology Institute, Itri. He didn't leave that post until 1994. And furthermore, Dr. Zhang was still serving as chairman of Vanguard Semiconductor, another foundry, he held that position until 2003, so he was not involved in the day-to-day -day at TSMC. They basically saw him once a month. Brooks, on the other hand, saw the numbers. He saw the incredible yields at the fabs and the economic power of scaling those fabs to huge sizes. And having worked in the American semiconductor industry for so long, he had sat in customers' chairs and understood their pains. So Brooks ignored his friend's words and got to work. And TSMC grew 54% a year throughout the six years he served as president. And then suddenly, Morris had always been a conservative man, a contrarian. I think he always told me the business was, you know, going to crap out and you're overinvesting and everything, but he didn't get in my way when it came down to doing it. So I think when he looked up in 95, 96 and saw what a success it was going to be and how important it was to Taiwan, I think he was just as surprised as anyone. Now I think when I told him I wanted to come back, I think he seized that opportunity to place himself as president 
and get some of the rewards that he thought he was due. And boy, he's done that. Brooks recalls these words with a bit of wistful bitterness. After a while, he wanted to go home to the U.S. and was originally supposed to work at an office there. But Morris eventually changed his mind, and Brooks resigned. He later joined TSMC's big rival, UMC, which did seem to have ruffled a few feathers with his old colleagues. He later passed away in Texas in 2013 at the age of 74. In an interview, Morris Dong said that he used to read Ecclesiastes 9-11 while he was at Harvard. It goes in part, The race is not to the swift, or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise, or wealth to the brilliant, or favor to the learned. But time and chance happen to them all. The business histories make it seem like as soon as the idea for TSMC fell out of Morris Dong's head, it sprouted into an overnight success. It has never been like that for anything, but particularly here. The reality seems to be that Morris Tang founded TSMC based on just one idea out of many. By then, Taiwan was already on its way to becoming a successful semiconductor producing power. TSMC then critically relied on a mix of hard-working Taiwanese, American-educated Taiwanese, and foreign semiconductor veterans to climb up the value chain and carve out a brand new industry niche for itself. Time and chance happens to us all. TSMC came at the right time and had the right chance and they made the most of it. All right, everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, sign up for the newsletter, and I'll see you guys next time.